On Tech News Today, Google publishes new details about how it's implementing Europe's right to be forgotten, and it ain't pretty. Plus, HP smartwatch is revealed, new calendar app uses behavioral economics to optimize your day, and Russia cracks down on bloggers. All that and more coming up right now on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, August 1st, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you'll finally have all your financial life in one place and get a clear view of everything you own. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash TNT. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. I'm Mike Elgin. Jason Howell is, has the day off and Brian Burnett is teleprompting today. Thank you for doing that today, Brian. Uh, the newly wed Brian Burnett. And our co-anchor uh, today is Don Reisinger, who writes for CNET and other fine publications. Welcome, hey, Don. Hey, what's up? Jason's got another day off? Yeah, he's uh, he's got another eye that uh, he's having trouble. No, I'm just kidding. Jason oh, is in perfect health. this guy? Yeah, too he's much, too sailing, time off. He's sailing the Caribbean or something like that. Uh, who knows what he's up to? too much, Mike. So Facebook went down today, and uh, the, yeah. the world gasped in horror uh, mostly on Twitter. I cried. I yeah. cried, actually. Yeah, so it's it's really amazing how impactful that is. I mean, it just Twitter exploded with commentary about the fact that Facebook was down. Uh, I don't know how long it was down. It was down when I left the house. By the time I got to work, it was back up again. Uh, so anyway, nobody panic. I also heard uh, rumors that Instagram was down as well. So uh, curious about what caused all of that. So Don Reisinger, what do you think? Should we get into the news? Let's Please. do it. All right, let's do this. As we reported previously, European regulators asked Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo to answer a 26-point questionnaire about its implementation of Europe's right-to-be-forgotten rules. Google answered and published their answers in a public Google Docs file. I love this, Don Reisinger, because, you know, this is all, Google keeps trying to make all this stuff public and really raise awareness about what it's being forced to do by the European uh, regulators. And Europe kind of is asking them, sort of implying that they're going to be asking Google to sort of keep it all kind of hush-hush, to sort of quietly censor uh, search results and so on. But uh, basically what's happening in this case uh, and what's making the news today is that uh, they posted this incredible 26-point uh, questionnaire with all their uh, detailed answers and some really interesting things emerge that will, if you don't already oppose Europe's right to be forgotten rules. You will oppose it when you hear the information that Google is publishing. Uh, now, generally speaking, um, they found that many, many requests are made with false and inaccurate information. Of course, Google is not a court. They don't have a huge army of fact checkers. And so they have to primarily rely on the claims of whoever it is that sends in a request. Uh, and the people who are sending requests are doing it for all kinds of reasons that are not covered under the right to be forgotten rules. And Google's being asked to sort this out. Um, for example, um, uh, Google got 90,000 requests for links to information to be taken down. And as of July 18th, approved about 53% of these requests. They're finding things like journalists, one of the juicy tidbits, is that journalists who have already left a publication and don't like some of the things they had written on that publication are asking the search results to be removed in terms of their byline uh, from Google search results. So in other words, if you search for Don Reisinger and they're being asked uh, for don't do it. those to Whatever not do, show the old it. publication, only the new one, because as you know, Don Reisinger, if you're in the journalism business, you know, typically you get out of college and you start writing obituaries for the local paper and then you work your way up and eventually you're Walt Mossberg and you retire uh, as a gazillionaire. And so you, you want people to forget those first few jobs you had uh, and people are using that, journalists are using that uh, with the right to be forgotten. But what was your, what was your feeling about this, uh, Don Reisinger, uh, about what they published today? You know, it's an interesting move. I think it's a smart move on Google's part. I, I, I feel as the from a Google PR perspective, I feel Google and Apple, as I said last week when we were here, are being targeted heavily by the EU. Uh, in many cases, rightly so. Um, in other cases, maybe a little bit too much. But I think Google, from a PR perspective, is saying, look, guys, you can play this game all you want with us. You can target us all you want, but we're going to embarrass you along the way. We're going to highlight some of the flaws in this law. We're going to show you why it, in our opinion, is ridiculous. And 
ultimately, we're going to get more people on our side. And I think that was the move here. The move here was how can we get more people to, to join Google's side and say, you know what? My evil EU, look what it's making poor Google do. Google is still playing the, the, the role of the small little startup that's doing nothing but good, and it's working out. Now, of course, those of us in the know and those of us who watch and, 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 and really work in the technology industry know that in many cases, Google might not, being, that might not be as um, uh, nice as it could be, not in many, but in some cases. And so Google is, really the EU is responding to that in some, in some degree. But Google is also saying here, look, we're not as bad as the EU says. We want all of the world to see us as the good people here. And the more information we put out there and the more ridiculous information we put out there, the more we can do that. So in a funny way, Google has spun this quite, quite well and is making the EU look bad. Now, overall, should the EU look bad? Probably not. I think there are some good, I, good things behind the right to be forgotten. But as a premise in and of itself, I think Google is doing a good job of highlighting just how difficult it is to really scrub things from the internet. Um, it's pretty much impossible. And I think Google's trying to illustrate that. Yeah, and I, I tend to uh, strongly disagree with the right to be forgotten for a number of reasons. I mean, I understand that this isn't your garden variety censorship. This isn't like China trying to remove search results for Tiananmen Square or the Falun Gong or something like that. It's not about... Uh, protecting politicians from dissidents or anything of that nature. This is really genuinely about protecting people from the fact that the Internet will hang on to information that becomes obsolete, that remains embarrassing, that's unfair to people, and so on. And so I understand that that's a valid desire to do something about that problem. The, 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 the problems that I have with it are that they're essentially putting censorship in the hands of private companies they, uh, that are being asked to essentially make judgments about the validity of people's claims. Let me tell you about one of the things that's happening here, which is that uh, there are people, lots of people have the same names. I mean, it's a common thing. Uh, some people have very common names where there are, you know, maybe dozens or hundreds or thousands of people with the exact same first and last name. And so a lot of the requests are actually coming from people who want uh, articles about other people with the same name removed because people believe that it's about them. So, for example... My name is Mike Elgin. Let's say there's another Mike Elgin somewhere in Europe who is a dirty, rotten uh, so-and-so, and he's, like, getting in all kinds of trouble and making all kinds of bad press, and people think it's me. Well, then I would go to Google and then do a, 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 a request for that information about the other Mike Elgin to be taken down. Apparently, this is happening quite a bit uh, to Google, and they, uh, they have limited ability to really figure out who is who. I mean, what are they going to do, ask for birth certificates uh, for both parties? I mean, what is their recourse for uh, sorting all this out. I mean, and that's exactly the point. The government is actually having censorship uh, being placed in the hands of private companies, and now they're going forward and essentially censoring the content. Well, Mike, let's not forget here as well that Google is the company that's releasing some of this ridiculous information. Google has a vested interest in seeing this ridiculous information shared and and to further undermine the right to be forgotten. I would agree that in many cases, this is ridiculous. It will be ridiculous. But Google is also the one here that has a vested interest in seeing it being forgotten, the right to be forgotten being forgotten. Um, so I think there might be some cases we're not hearing about that are very, very relevant. They make sense and they do help the, the people out there. So I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm I'm a little bit on the fence on this. I would agree more with you in that the right to be forgotten probably should be uh, outlawed in some way, or at least the government should find a way to to regulate it a little bit more effectively. But let's not forget here that Google again has a vested interest in seeing people like us say, "Ah, this is nonsense. This should be thrown out." Okay. So one, one last parting shot. My own view is that if news, uh, let's say the Guardian newspaper printed a story that has now become something that's an embarrassment to somebody and is no longer valid or relevant or accurate, then I think the government should have a process, the European Union government, if you will, should have a process to go to the Guardian newspaper and have that information censored. Okay, I don't believe in censorship and I don't think they should do that, but I believe that instead of censoring that information, they're going after the search engine and making it slightly less convenient for people to find out the truth about things. And in doing so, they're making search engines 
radically inaccurate. And that's what we're leading to. We're, we're basically, they're basically putting a wedge between the internet and the search engines, which are supposed to be an accurate reflection of the internet. And they're making the search engines inaccurate as a solution to the problem of wanting to censor things that they can't censor because they do have uh, freedom of the press uh, and freedom of speech rules in the European Union. So it seems to me that, you know, let's, let's censor the American search engine uh, so we don't have to try to censor the European newspaper. That's essentially what's happening, and I don't like the fact that search engines are being made irrelevant, and inevitably what's going to happen is there will be a, a, a growing demand for search engines that don't follow these rules. And so I don't know what the point of that is. So uh, in any event, we're, it's a really interesting thing, and everybody can go and read Google's answers on this. It's very detailed, and we'll provide a link in our show notes uh, that you can find uh, on the twit.tv site. Well, in just a sec, we're going to hear about a new smartwatch from an unexpected company. But first, I want to tell you about personal capital. Personal capital will help you get your finances in order, and one of the ways they do that is they'll let you enter in all of your financial information, all your accounts, and it'll bring all that information together so you can see it all in one place. It's very difficult to really intuitively understand how your, your investments, your stocks, your savings, your 401k, in an all these other kinds of sources of information add up. What is your ultimate balance? Where are you headed? Personal capital will help you understand all of that so you can make much better investment decisions. It brings it all together, and you can look at it on your computer, phone, or tablet with intuitive real-time graphs. Real-time, when something changes with your money, it's reflected in the graph immediately. It's also uh, reflected on your wristwatch if you have a Google Play device and you've installed the app. Uh, Personal Capital is one of the first companies that supported Android Wear, uh, and you can download the Android Wear app. Uh, the way to do that, basically, is you, you install the Android app, and then you use the Android Wear app uh, on the Android device to essentially enable the uh, personal capital feature. And it's really a great app. It puts your financial information right there on your wrist. And if something alarming happens, your wrist will be notified. And it's very handy to have it right there on your wrist. Personal capital also shows you how much you're overpaying on fees, and they'll show you how to reduce those fees. So not only is personal capital free, but they'll actually save you money right away. And you can also get tailored advice on optimizing your investment. So set up a free account. Go to personalcapital.com slash TNT. And remember that personal capital is free, and it's the smart way to grow your money. And we thank personal capital for their support of Tech News Today. Nice. Well, Don, somebody's got a new smartwatch coming down the road, and it looks pretty nice. Yeah, well, it looks pretty nice. It should be interesting to see what's going on. So Hewlett Packard and Gilt, which is the luxury e-marketplace, uh, have announced that they are going to be offering a new smartwatch this fall. We don't have a beautiful. lot of... Yeah, well, it's nice looking. Okay, fine. It's fine. So we don't have many details just yet, but we have here with us Slash Gear writer and editor Chris Burns over from my stomping grounds over at Slash Gear. That's where I write a weekly column. Mike, in case you're wondering, in case you want to read it. Chris, how you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. Good. So, Chris, let's start out first and foremost. Tell us about this thing. What do we know so far about this HP smartwatch? So far, we know who the designer is. He's uh, generally a designer who works on men's clothing lines. Uh, he, you know, generally makes stuff for a, a more fashionable crowd. This isn't the sort of stuff that just anybody will wear. Um, if you look uh, at his past with designing accessories, he usually makes stuff like ties. But he has actually made a couple of smart watches, or a couple of watches rather, with uh, Gant, G-A-N-T. These watches look uh, pretty standard. I mean, they look, I mean, they're, they're obviously high end. They're limited edition. Um, but he's. Uh, this is one of his. This is one of his first uh, ventures into this sort of space. Now, what I find interesting about it is that their approach here appears to be from a, a different perspective than the rest of the smartwatches that have come out so far. What I mean by that is, it looks to be targeting people who would already be wearing a watch or who would want to be fashionable, uh, rather than targeting people who want their uh, smartphone to be extended. I mean, I've, I've seen a couple of comments so far that say they are going to be talking about that, like they'll be talking about what it does and that sort of thing as, as primary functions of the watch, but it just seems like they're taking a different, uh, completely different angle towards smartwatches in general. We're talking to Chris Burns at Slash Gear. Now, Chris, 
what is HP's role here? Do they have any special technology uh, that they're going to be bringing to the table? Are they going to be selling it themselves? Will they be bundling it with uh, servers? I mean, what, what is HP doing uh, in this project? We know very little about what HP is doing so far. Um, at the moment, it would appear, just, just from how they've uh, you know, put up the first materials so far, it, it would appear that they're not even going to uh, be putting HP on the watch. If they do, it'll be underneath, underneath it so you can barely see it. It seems that HP will be making doing the, the manufacturing and probably the software. But it'll be interesting to see what they do with the software because they don't, uh, you know, they're not in the market of making their own sort of software at this minute. Um, it just seems like they'll be taking sort of a backseat, believe it or not. Well, we, we do know that it's supposed to be Android of some kind. We don't know whether it's going to be Android Wear, but if, if, if HP is going to be doing the software, that would mean that they're either not going to do Android Wear or they're right. talking about special apps, uh, maybe watch faces or stuff that uh, alerts, I don't know, uh, IT admins yeah. about uh, server things. I, I, who, I, it's hard to imagine what HP is doing. They're not really into the consumer electronics thing anymore, so it's really interesting right. that they're doing this. Um, do you have any uh, uh, information about whether this will be Android Wear or some some custom forked version of Android? I would, I put my money on saying it'd be either a forked version of Android or it'll be something. I mean, that'd be really weird, but something completely new. I only say that because it says, uh, or they've said that it's going to work with um, iPhone as well. So it'll be working with Bluetooth more than likely, and I wouldn't think that they would get too far into Android if they're going to be uh, supporting both ecosystems. Most devices that come out now that, that aren't just directly Android support iPhone as well. Uh, you take Pebble, for example, um, and I'm guessing they're gonna go that route as well and staying extremely simple. So uh, I wouldn't expect too much crazy stuff going on with apps. Chris, this, does this, I mean, this is my opinion and then uh, you know I'd like to hear what you think. I think this is just another example of HP being really kind of odd. Um, I don't understand the whole guilt partnership. I don't understand why it has been so quiet about this. I don't understand much of any of this. I think this is HP making another potentially bad move. What do you think of this? Do you think this thing could actually be successful? I mean, it's going to be available exclusively through guilt, from my understanding. Available this fall. There's no price yet. HP isn't talking about it. What is HP thinking? I think HP did that very much on purpose. Uh, some of the first stories that came out on this actually came out yesterday or even the day before. HP didn't put out a big release on it, and HP isn't, uh, as, a, as you can see, again, there's not a massive HP logo on this device. Uh, what I think they're doing is uh, sort of demonstrating, without making a big fuss about it, that they are able to do different sorts of de de devices. And especially since the limited edition design and, you know, they're selling it to a really, really specific crowd. I don't, I, I can't see it as the same sort of move like, uh, you know, like Google's making with Android Wear coming out before, if there's ever going to be uh, an iWatch. Um, I, I just don't, I don't see it as a big power move by HP, really. Yeah, it is very strange, and uh, it does look good, though. It looks like a really cool watch. They just might guilt me into buying one. Chris Burns well, is at SlashGear.com, slash and you can follow him on Twitter at T underscore Chris Burns. Thank you so much for joining us on Tech News Today. Thanks, Chris. Duke Behavioral Economics professor and author Dan Ariely has released a free iPhone calendar app, of all things, that helps you make the most of your day. The app is called Timeful, and it performs some interesting tricks based on science. Science, Don Reisinger. Josh Ong is the U.S. editor for The Next Web and joins Science. us now to ta talk about this. Welcome, Josh. Thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. So what's different and special about this app? Well, I think the science is, is the main part of the app that really is, is trying to take a different approach. Um, and the big question is uh, whether, you know, behavioral economics, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, we have this collaboration from some really smart people and whether all those can get packed into an app and make you more efficient, make you um, more productive with your time, and, and ultimately keep you from making bad decisions or poor decisions about uh, how you schedule your life. <laughs> so, so, Josh, uh, excuse my cynicism here, but 
is science really going to be enough to make a dent in a crowded marketplace with tons of, of, of apps just like this, with tons of really good apps just like this? Is science really going to make that much of a dent? I'm certainly um, somewhat skeptical about um, the role that the academic research that um, Dan and some of his uh, partners have have used to really to, to back this app. Um, but but I think that the truth is we we waste a lot of our time, you know, and um, and Dan's research is particularly in uh, why people do things irrationally, why why we make the kind of choices that we make that often don't make sense. And so what, what the app's trying to do is um, help us to think through, okay, when's the most productive time of my day and what are the most important tasks that I want to, I want to put in there? And so uh, what, what Timeful did is they created something called an intention genome. Uh, and they're, it's kind of modeled off the, uh, the music genome project that Pandora did. And what they did is... Um, what Timeful did is they took all the different tasks that you have and they, and they evaluated them on um, kind of like, well, why do you want to do it? How important is it? Is it, you know, good or bad? You know, and all these kind of different aspects of, of the tasks that we have to do. And then they use that to rank how they automatically fill in your schedule. Yeah, the feature is called Habits, and basically you tell the app that you'd like to exercise more, you'd like to do this, you'd like to do that, little information about how long it takes you to do those things. And then it will pop up with suggestions saying, hey, you know, you've got a few hours, why don't you go running, or why don't you do uh, one of these other habits Ever. that you'd like to, to form. Now, Ariely is a really fascinating character. I've loved his tech talks, I've loved his books. He was also the uh, interview subject, uh, interviewed by Leo Laporte on Triangulation last year, so go search for episode 85 if you want to learn more about Dan Ariely. Really fascinating guy. And he's one of three co-founders of this company. Uh, Josh Ong, is there any other interesting uh, information about this app besides uh, the behavioral economics uh, claim? I mean, I, I think that's the main the main piece. I mean, it's, it's a really beautiful app. It's well designed. Um, and there are a lot of other calendar apps out there. Um, I think it's going to really depend on whether you're you're interested in really packing your schedule in, yeah, uh, I don't I, I don't actually use a calendar to fill in everything that I'm doing, and so it would as I wrote in my article, I, I think it would take a pretty serious change in my behavior to go in and block out all the times like okay I'm you know I'm gonna go here at this time and I, I want to squeeze something in. Yeah, there are and two. I think for, yeah, there are two kinds of people. They're, they're the kind of people uh, like you and me who just like to keep it kind of loose and just put down the main uh, items that we have to do. And then there are other types of people who like to schedule every single thing they do. And I think that this app, as you're saying, is for the latter category of person. Uh, so that that's kind of an interesting uh, attribute to this. Uh, it also has to be noted that this app will support other calendar technologies, so it'll bring in calendar data from Google Calendar and other uh, sources of information like that. Well, Josh Ong, I want to thank you for coming on Tech News today. Josh Ong writes at the nextweb.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Beijing Dow. Why Beijing Dow? You used to work in China, right? Yeah, so I spent five years in China, and um, uh, Do or Dao, it means bean, so um, okay. it was just kind of a nickname, and now I'm stuck with it. So, well, what, what, May I ask, what, uh, what was it like living in China? That must have been uh, crazy, especially Beijing. The air quality is not so hot, I understand. It was terrible. I mean, we, we'd get filters and masks and stuff, but um, I mean, the air was terrible. Yeah. I had a great time in Beijing, though. I, yeah. it's, a, it's an exciting time to be there. Certainly, there's issues like censorship and um, you know freedom, but, but it's also um, just being on the ground, there's... Um, lots of development happening. There's some interesting tech stuff and some copying. So uh, it's, a, it's a fun time to be there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for coming on Tech News today. Hope to have you back soon. Thanks for Thanks having Josh. me. Josh. Cheers. Well, Don hey, Reisinger, looks like, looks like Russia is cracking down on bloggers, blogger types, uh, our kind of yeah. people. What, what's going on in Russia? Hey, we were just talking about China, censorship, the whole thing. I mean, it's, it's a great segue to Russia with the blogger law. Now, this blogger law is kind of fascinating. Um, basically, this blogger law says that any person that has over 3,000 daily readers must register with the, the Russian government, the regulators that monitor the, the Internet to make sure you're not violating any law, 
And you must disclose personal information like your personal information, like your name, your, your contact information and things of that nature. Now, Russia's organization, which is the – I'm going to have to look this uh, at, at this because I don't even know how the hell to say it. Roskomandazar, Zor, you say it, Mike, three times fast. Please go ahead. I have no idea how to say that. Um, whatever it is, that's the internet regulator in Russia. They're saying, all right, look. You have 3,000 readers and you're talking about your cats all day because you found a lot of cat friends. We're not really going to care too much if you register. But if you're called upon by us, so in many cases that's probably going to be those who are um, opposing the, the political the political environment in Russia, those who want more freedom of speech, those who want more freedom of press, those are the ones that are going to be targeted have already been targeted you are going to have to register and you're going to be potentially liable for anything you say. And here's the best part. Anything, any misinformation that is shared in the comments of your blog. So that means you don't have to create it. You don't have to say it. You don't have to do anything. You now are responsible for anything anyone says on your site at any time of the day. And you could face either a fine or potentially some people, some critics in Russia say jail time. Yeah, this is clearly an an attempt and likely a, a, a successful attempt to intimidate uh, opponents and critics of the government uh, into silence and into uh, doing what they're told. Uh, basically, the bloggers need to register if they're asked to register. In other words, when the Kremlin contacts you and you're a blogger and they say, we'd like you to register, uh, that means we're watching you and we're watching everything you say and we're thinking about arresting you or taking action against you, so uh, watch your behind. This is a part of a larger crackdown on freedom of expression within Russia that just keep becoming, they're, they're kind of like, uh, they kind of remind me of Iran uh, to a certain extent where Iran, like, you know, just a decade and a half ago had a totally free and open internet. It was really great, no censorship, and just over the years they slowly just cracked down this, that, the other thing, and next thing you know, it's a it's a pretty repressive uh, state, and Russia is going in the same direction, and they're using this kind of uh, rule, uh, the, this kind of law, to sort of crack down on on dissent, and more importantly, to intimidate uh, critics and rivals of the government, and uh, it's a it's a kind of a terrible thing, I think, uh, that they're doing this. And yeah. uh, but it's it's pretty clear what they're doing. They're they're trying to you know bring back the glory days of the Soviet Union when um, when Rick, everybody. Those are so glorious. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, it's, it's <laughs> let me try one more time, Mike. Let me try one more time. I just I was thinking about what you were talking. I wasn't listening to you. I yeah you know that's the, that nonsense. But no, it was uh, here we go. Ready for this? Roskom Nadzor. You got it right there. Roskom Don Nadzor. Putin would like you to register. Uh, after <laughs> after gonna, trying gonna to pronounce that name, so please uh, please register, register immediately. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of, of of strange stories, remember those Google barges, the mysterious floating showrooms Google built out of shipping containers? Well, now the Portland Press Herald in the state of Maine is reporting that Google is dismantling at least one of them and turning the metal into scrap. The 250 foot barges, 63 shipping containers were stacked to create a four story building on the boat. And there's no word on what's to become of the West Coast barge that appeared in San Francisco Bay last year. What a great use of hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, Don Reisinger. This was really a, a wonderful exercise. And, um, you know, I just I just hope they hang on to one barge. I just love the barge stories. I love yeah, the barge. Oh yeah. who, who doesn't? But it's you're right, Mike. It, this is really fascinating. These major tech companies now, they don't care. They'll spend tons and tons of money. Throw it away. They're not. They're hardly paying anything in taxes. Anyway, what do they care? So they're making billions every quarter. They're hardly paying anything in taxes. They build these things for fun. They go, ah, screw it. We'll just throw it out for scrap. It's a fascinating story. I think it's fascinating. We're going to be seeing these things more and more over time. Not barges necessarily, but this kind of spending, and they just don't care. And the best part is the investors don't care because they're so big, the Apples and Googles and of the world, that. It's immaterial to them. It's like, oh yeah, build all the barges you want, throw them into the into the the Pacific. Who cares? Well, uh, this some people. This is interesting. Yeah, some people are 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 uh, saying that the fate of the barges mirrors the fate of Google Glass as a pro, as a uh, legitimate consumer electronics device. Uh, before they've even shipped Google Glass, it's already got a horrible reputation in the public, uh, but not among some thieves in New York City. Um, interesting <laughs> story there.
Yeah, so a tourist uh, in, to New York City named Mike Geller got his Google Glass headset stolen recently. So the thief who asked to try it on, he put it on, and once he was wearing it, he ran away. But here's the best part. He didn't know that Geller was using a third-party glassware app called Live Lens that was live streaming video all day long. So Geller took all of that video, put it into a YouTube video, and showed exactly what this person was doing all day long. He went on the, he, he went, I think he went on the subway. He bought some Heineken's. He was putting his shoes on. He, he put a watch on. It was fascinating. Not that HP watch. He was putting lots of stuff on. It was fascinating video. Now, and, the, and then he went think, to a rave. Yeah, exactly. So, I don't think he actually stepped in front of a mirror, though, which would have helped us. That would have been great. Guy. Let's let's take a look at that video. Yeah, he is walking in the store. This is fascinating footage. <laughs> Got That's some it. beer. Pick it. That's the good stuff. Uh, did he get a, a release on, on, on her showing her face on video? I don't think so. So here he is getting ready so. for a night out on the town. He's got his Heineken yeah. and his pack of cigs. It's Take a, a little drink the there. Night. This is It's just like being a, a New York criminal. Yeah, this is the life of New York. We just live the life of New York criminal. Like, Interesting never taste. never commit crime. Interesting taste in music there. Yeah, oh, yeah. He's a rambling like man. And there we go. So there you go. You went on a roller coaster? How about that? I mean, this he, guy he did, did it yeah. all. It's a long video. This person is having a great time in New York City, and you can see they it all. They do it all in New York City. It's, it's incredible. Well, that that is the tech news today. Don Reisinger, what have you been working on these days? I'm working on everything. I'm working with you, Mike, trying to work on you. I don't know. We still got a lot a lot of way to go for that. Working on your but German no, pronunciation, your Russian pronunciation. Yeah, my Russian. The only Russian pronunciation I know is vodka. Vodka. Is that how you say that? I have, I have no idea. Please register Whatever it immediately. Is, it tastes nice. <laughs> All right, Don Reisinger. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, and we Thanks will see lot, you Mike. next Friday on Tech News Today. Okay. All right. If I'm we, not drinking too much vodka. Yeah. Don't drink too much. Uh, well, you can subscribe to Tech News Today on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, Feedly, Yahoo, RSS, so many options. Choose your favorite at twit.tv slash TNT. And follow us on Twitter. Tech News Today TV is our Twitter name. And please send us your thoughts and opinions. Comment on Twitter or Google Plus using the hashtag Tech News Today. Or send email to TNT at twit.tv or leave voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. And don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific tonight. I'll be anchoring the show myself tonight and every weeknight right here on the Twit Network. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you Monday. Dun, 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 dun.